my goodness, things are getting intense. In our study of Luke's gospel, he has brought us up into these days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. And my goodness, Jesus is under constant scrutiny. Uh, There is an intensive effort to attempt to try to trap Jesus, to trip him up, to find some way that he can be accused. Uh, The intention of his opponents is not just for his defeat, but for his total destruction. And so Jesus is under this extreme pressure constantly in these days. And so when we read in Luke's gospel, they uh, just time after time, they are on the attack with Jesus. They're asking him questions. They are trying to ensnare him and entrap him. Uh, It is such a difficult time. So today, uh, welcome, by the way, to our study today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 20. This is going to be class number 17. I don't know if anybody's keeping up with that kind of thing other than me, but uh, this will be class 17. We're going to be studying from Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 27 and going on into chapter 21 and verse 4. Uh, Again, there is a study sheet available on Facebook, church's Facebook page, this class, Facebook group, and then I even I actually even posted it on my personal Facebook page as well. Uh, some questions to help get us kind of engaged in the text and what's going on here. So we'll start in verse 27 of chapter 20. Uh, but before actually before we do that, I want us to read the final verse. I don't think I spent hardly any time with this or any time at all with this. In our last class, verse 26, they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. Now, it wasn't for lack of effort because they were trying, but they just they couldn't accomplish it. They couldn't get the job done, but they were marveling at his answers. These are his opponents that marvel at, at how Jesus is able to handle what they are constantly throwing at them. And finally, they became silent. They, they, they just they didn't have a response. They didn't have anything that they could say any further to Jesus. They are about to their wit's end as far as how to accomplish what they're wanting to accomplish in regard to Jesus. So they're going to have to change tactics, and they will. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly see that as we continue on. But now, <clears throat> in verse 27, they're there came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question. Now, this is the first time that the Sadducees, and actually it's the only time that the Sadducees are explicitly mentioned in Luke's Gospel. They are implicitly mentioned. We noted this in our last study when we find the scribes and the chief priests become prominent players in this effort to try to deal with Jesus uh, because the chief priests were Sadducees. Now, Sadducees, uh, Luke tells us here that they didn't believe in that there is a resurrection. They denied the resurrection. And that theological point, that was one of the distinctives about Sadducees, was this theological point. Uh, and it's pertinent to what the question they're going to ask. Uh, Sadducees were really, they were the upper echelon of the Jewish establishment. They were the ones who were in control of all of the religious structures, the national religious structures. They were in control of what happened at, uh, at the temple. They were the ones who really had control in the Sanhedrin, the high court of the Jews. There were more Sadducees in that Sanhedrin than any other group represented there. Uh, They were very political. Uh, Their their dealings were political, which also distinguished them from other sects of the Jews. And they were also very wealthy. Uh, They were not popular with the people. The Pharisees were very popular with the people. The Sadducees were not popular with the people. 
But again, what this shows us is this concern over Jesus has just continued to rise in the ranks of established Judaism in Palestine. And now it's reached the very top. And so the Sadducees take their hand, uh, take their turn at attempting to do what others have failed to do. I, I don't know. It's not hard to imagine that there, there might have been some level of smugness on their part. Uh, they, they seemed to have been apparently a, a kind of a haughty people. Uh, they thought they were better than others, knew more than others. And, and so, okay, you guys couldn't deal with Jesus. Let us handle this. And the way they went about this was to ask this question of Jesus. Their question was a reference, first of all, to what's called the, the Leveret Law from the Law of Moses. And that is, well, as Luke explains this, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. That's what's known as the Leveret Law. And so it's based on that they propose this hypothetical scenario that in their minds disproves the possibility of the resurrection. So they say, okay, so we have this man and his wife married, no children, he dies. And so according to Moses' writing, then his brother is to take that woman and raise up children. Well, suppose then that he dies, and so then the next brother takes up that wife. And so it goes through seven brothers. And so finally they ask, we get down here to the, the question, uh, verse 33, In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For seven had her as wife. And so they felt like this hypothetical scenario disproved any possibility of the resurrection. Uh, this, this was probably, in all likelihood, kind of their pet argument. When they would debate with Pharisees or others, uh, this is the argument that they felt like just kind of settled it all. I don't know, we've probably all been in that kind of a scenario with folks, maybe even religious neighbors, uh, who, who develop a hypothetical scenario that they believe disproves what Scripture teaches. Uh, I think we've had, probably most of us have had that experience, uh, but those hypotheticals... <laughs> Uh, that, that's, you're, you're standing on pretty shaky ground if that's the basis for your argument. And Jesus is going to cut right through this, just like He's done with every challenge He's faced so far. So Jesus says to them, this is starting in verse 34, "...the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So Jesus has a two-pronged approach to answering their question. And the first one is, you're completely misunderstanding something here. You're making an assumption that what is true in this age and this life in regard to marriage carries over into the age that has come, the age of the resurrection. And Jesus said it's not that way at all. Uh, marriage is something that is for this existence, this life. There is no indication that marriage relationships that are a part of our existence here carry over in, in, beyond this life, in the life that is to come after the resurrection. And Jesus says, no, they do not. That rather, our existence then is like that of the angels. And there is no marriage among the angels. There will be no marriage among those who are a part of the resurrection. So your, your hypothetical argument falls because of a wrong assumption so that's his first response. The second response that he gives uh, is this, starting in verse 37. <clears throat> 
but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living. The, the implication of that statement from Moses is the fact that though from a physical standpoint, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are deceased, that doesn't mean their existence has ceased. God is the God of the living, not the dead. And so, all are, all live to Him. And so, their attempt, that is the Sadducees' attempt to discredit Jesus and to trap Jesus and to win an argument against Him were just as unsuccessful as everybody else who has come to try to do the same prior to them. And this little section then ends with this observation, for they no longer dared to ask Him any questions. And so... The enemies of Jesus, they're, they're striking out. They are absolutely striking out in trying to destroy Jesus by this means. They're going to have to do something different. And they will do something different. Now, I, I want to go to our study questions here for just a second and, and make sure I'm covering these things. What was behind the Sadducees' questioning of Jesus? What did they hope to accomplish and how? Well, they were wanting to discredit Jesus, just like the others had been attempting to do. Uh, and they were going to accomplish it through a theological argument, their pet theological argument, which obviously failed. Number two, what proof did Jesus provide for the reality of the resurrection? Well, first of all, it was an explanation of what our existence after this life was like. It just it, it didn't carry over necessarily. Marriage is a part of this, but it will not be a part of that. But then secondly, from a statement of Scripture regarding uh, God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that takes care of the first two. Uh, we did answer those. <clears throat> we'll move on then to this fourth or third one. And the, the question that I've asked here is what point or points did Jesus make in asking the question about David? So, they, Jesus has been being asked questions. Now, Jesus is going to turn the tables, as it were, and He's going to ask the question. But He said to them, How can they, uh, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? So Jesus is turning the tables. He has been, he has been being peppered with questions. And now he turns it and he's going to go on the offensive, if you will, here for just a, a moment. Now, David is revered uh, among the Jews. You, you might remember that when Peter speaks on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and remember Luke is the author of that as he is the author of this, uh, Peter argues, well, you might even say primarily from what David has written. And why was that? Because David was revered by these people. They believed what David said. There was no question in their minds about David. And so if that's what David said, then okay, then this is something that we need to pay attention to. So uh, Jesus himself here uses David in a statement from the Psalms. The Lord said to my Lord... Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So David is writing and says, The Lord said to my Lord. Uh, the Lord God said to the Messiah, as, as it were. That's, that's what he's saying here. The, the Lord God said to the Messiah, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But David refers to the Messiah as Lord. I think I can think about four things here that, that uh, Jesus was doing. 
Uh, one is that he was addressing the understanding of these people about the, the Messiah, who was, remember, referred to as the son of David. The son of David in, in the sense that he was a descendant of David. Uh, a son of David in the sense that he would be like unto David. And you remember, David was the warrior king. And so they're thinking the Messiah is going to be this physical descendant of David. And so he's going to be a man. But here, the title Lord, deity, he's God. This is a, 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 a not to, uh, <laughs> uh, what am I trying to say here? This is a, a statement by Jesus that is not exactly explicit, but it's not m much hidden either, uh, that he is claiming deity here. Now, how much of that they picked up on, we don't know. But <clears throat> the point is, though, that your idea of this Messiah is mistaken. Uh, he, is not, he is not the son of David in the sense that he is going to be like David. That is this warrior king, and that's what they were expecting. That's not going to be his, his place or position or mission at all. So, uh, on the one hand... The Messiah would not be like David, but rather he is David's Lord. Uh, number two, he was not a man. He was deity. Number three, uh, well, that, that he is deity, I guess. Okay. But then finally, this is being said to people who prided themselves on their mastery of the Word of God. Uh, they were looked upon by others as being ones who knew God's Word. And yet Jesus takes a question based on the Word of God, things that they were familiar with, characters, David, with whom they were very familiar, and showed they didn't understand at all. And so as they had been attempting to discredit Jesus, uh, Jesus really does strike a blow here against them and discredits them because they had no answer for what Jesus said here in a, an explicit statement from Scripture. And so we have this back and forth between Jesus and these uh, religious authorities who are trying to bring Him down. Then finally, in chapter 20, we have a warning given by Jesus in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes. Okay, in the hearing of all the people, Jesus issues a warning against the scribes. That might not carry much emotional punch to us, but it certainly did to those who were hearing Jesus. Because the scribes were like the Pharisees in that they were ones whom the people admired and respected, not just a little bit, a lot, because the scribes were considered to be experts in the law, experts in the Word of God. If they wanted to know what the Word of God said, it was to these men that they went. If they wanted to know how the Word of God should be understood and applied, I mean, these scribes held a very prominent place in the lives of these Jews. And here Jesus is explicitly giving warning to the people about them. I've been mentioning the fact that Jesus has been shining this glaring light on these people, showing them for who and what they truly are. And certainly that's exactly what's taking place here. But let's notice what Jesus says about them, who, who like to walk around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplaces and best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feasts. You can you get a picture here of how they are revered by people, how they're treated, and they love it. That's what they love about being scribes, is that very fact. And who devour widows' houses, who take advantage of the weak, and the helpless to their own advancement and for pretense make long prayers they they show off their religiosity i guess you could say they 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 do the things 
that will make people admire them. But Jesus says they will receive the greater condemnation. The question I ask here is, what were the scribes' great failings? Uh, here are people for whom their religion had become a means of pride and self-promotion. Uh, they, they saw it as something that elevated them uh, above other men. Uh, it, it gave them the opportunity to take advantage of other people. And it just it made Jesus sick. And remember, these are people, these scribes are people that the, the, the people, <laughs> these were people whom the people, the masses, uh, looked up to and thought they ought to emulate and wish they could be more like. And Jesus says, no, absolutely not. And so he issues, issues this warning. This, this, there's a parallel to this, of course, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23. But there, you might remember these woes pronounced by Jesus are to uh, address to scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. It's not that it, this was exclusively true of the scribes, uh, but Luke, for whatever reason, has chosen to specify the scribes uh, as the ones against whom Jesus issues this warning. Okay, we're going to look at one more section, and this comes in chapter 21. Uh, these first four verses, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Uh, Jesus is in the temple. That's where he's spending his time, uh, and it's in the courts of the temple. And there were in the outer courts these receptacles, and what uh, historians Josephus uh, tells us is that they were shaped kind of like trumpets. You know how they have this flared opening? And that was the place to which people could come and make their offerings or pay their temple tax. And the rich would come. Uh, Luke is not the one who indicates this to us. We find this in other Gospels. But they would make a great show of what they were doing and how much they were, were giving. They wanted people's attention drawn to them in that process. And so Jesus is here in the temple and he's watching this take place. And as that is happening, it says he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. I mean, worthless. I mean, monetarily, physically, it's worthless. And yet Jesus says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. I mean, you talk about saying something that just completely... It blows these people away. I, I, what do you mean, Jesus? How can you even say that? This is what she gave is as close to being of no value, monetary value, as anything. And yet, then here are these other rich people who are putting bags of gold, bags of money in. And you're saying what she gave is worth more than what they gave? How in the world could that possibly be true? Uh, what I, what I want to do here before we, we go on and finish that fourth verse is the question number five, with whom does the poor widow stand in contrast? Well, obviously she stands in contrast to the rich who are also given. But think about this, uh, this incident regarding the poor widow follows immediately on the heels of the scribes. And remember the description of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and they receive these elaborate greetings in the marketplaces and they're given the best places in the seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feast and yet these are the people who are admired and so i i think this poor widow is contrasted not only to the rich but also to people like the scribes these are the people these are the ones that the people elevate in their minds, but here is the person whom God elevates. The very kind of person who is disregarded and set aside and not given a second thought to by people. That's the one that God's paying attention to and He's taking note of. And He's drawing attention to her 
Uh, the, the last question that is asked here is, how does God measure giving? Well, in addition to that, I think we need to ask the question is, how does God measure people? Because we know how people measure people, and God does not measure people the same way that we do. And that's such an obvious thing here. Jesus, when He's questioned about uh, how... Well, we're not told that he's questioned, but you know that question is in the minds of people when Jesus says she gave more than all of them. He said, they all contributed out of their abundance. In essence, they're giving to God what's left over. They take their abundance of finances and they apply it to whatever they want to in their lives and then whatever they happen to have that's left over, then that's what ends up going to God. And for some of these people, they were so wealthy, they had a lot left over, and so they gave a lot, numerically speaking. But Jesus says, you see, what this woman did, out of her poverty, she put in all that she had to live on. She didn't wait to see what she had left over, because quite frankly, if she had applied that first to uh, her own needs, she would have had nothing left over and therefore nothing to give. But she, she first gave everything that she had. She didn't wait. Uh, she didn't, she, that, that was a decision that she made that what she had was the Lord's and that's what she was going to give to Him. You, you see a great difference between their approaches and, and I think it is still true that God measures our giving in that same kind of way. God, are we waiting to see what's left over to give to God? Or do we decide first and foremost that this is what I give to God? It's all at His disposal. Remember back to the rich young ruler, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Uh, Jesus telling us that everything we have must be at His disposal. And, and here was this poor woman who was demonstrating that very kind of an attitude and disposition in her giving. So, here we are. Uh, Jesus is, you know, we can, we can be counting down to His crucifixion in terms of hours now. And He has been going through this very dramatic and traumatic week of being attacked constantly. And yet Jesus continues to use uh, these opportunities to teach those who would hear Him and powerful message and lessons to be learned, to be sure. Uh, we're going to continue our study. We're going to pick up in verse 5 of chapter 21 for our next one and go through verse 38. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 38. And we'll look forward to being a part of that study together. We'll see you then. Thank you.